My name is Jian Hua Bai, uh, the uh, professor of Chinese at Kenyan. Uh, for the past year, I'm serving as the uh, project director for the Ohio Five Modern Language Enrichment Grant. And I uh, want to take this opportunity to, to thank Sarah Stone. Uh, she is not here today. Um, she is an executive director of Five Colleges of Ohio. Uh, I want to thank her for her leadership and hard work to make these uh, workshops possible. Uh, I will thanks also go to the Mellon Foundation uh, for funding these important uh, professional development opportunities. And um, our special thanks to, this, uh, to our speakers today, uh, Professor Andrew Covian will uh, do the introduction uh, of our speakers. So Andrea. Yes, good afternoon, and it's good to see all of you. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. I actually first heard them um, give a talk at the G GLCA Languages Conference at Hope College back in October 2017. And after we heard your presentation, my colleagues and I at, here at Ohio Wesleyan found ourselves referring back a lot to what we had learned from you and talking a lot about it. So I'm so excited that today we'll get to hear some updates and some new information and to hear about how things are going now. So I will go in the order in which I see you on the screen, <laughs> starting with Tracy Dennison. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, great. Tracy is an Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and a Professor of Spanish at Simpson College, where she has served for the past 15 years. And most recently, she has worked in student success, retention, and transition programs. And in the fall, she will be returning to the Spanish classroom. Um, Patricia Kalkins, um, this past December, retired as a professor of German after almost 25 years at Simpson. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <That's> wonderful. <laughs> Besides building the successful German program for which she taught all courses at all levels of the curriculum, she also specialized in teaching intercultural communication for, for language majors and the general education curriculum. In addition, she accompanied German students for semesters abroad eight different times. And towards the end of her German career, she completed a master's degree in TESOL and began teaching English to refugees in Des Moines. She has continued teaching ESL since her retirement and intends to do so for the foreseeable future. That's great. And finally, Sharon Wilkinson directed the lower level French program at West Virginia University for 11 years before moving to Simpson College in Iowa, where she and her colleagues spent more than a decade redesigning their language programs around culture. Most recently, Sharon has taken a position at Duolingo, where she is a senior educational content developer, leading a team that designs content for the French course for English speakers. So thank you again so much for joining us, and we are excited to hear and learn from you this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm just going to get my screen set up here to get us started. Okay. Well, we are so grateful to all of you for being here on a Friday afternoon. That's amazing. And we're really looking forward to this discussion. We're looking forward to thinking and rethinking with you this afternoon. As was mentioned, um, this presentation is related to another presentation that we did a while back at Hope College. And that presentation is actually recorded. You may have had a chance to see it. It's still online. Um, I think that Trisha is going to drop that in the chat if you haven't I already. just did. OK. So there's a link there in the chat if you want to if you want to look that up and you haven't had a chance to see that presentation. You'll see um, connections between those two presentations, but they're not sequenced. So it's perfectly fine to attend this one first and then go back and see that one or have seen that one and come to this one. Basically, we're going back and rethinking. So that presentation talked about what we did and we're going to do some of that here too. but we're gonna concentrate a little bit more on what we had to rethink in order to change our, what we were doing. And we're gonna focus on this 
um, issue of proficiency and persistence. But I wanna start uh, with some anecdotes from my own rethinking about proficiency and persistence. So the first anecdote comes from an experience that I had in Switzerland. I took a gap year after high school and I went to Switzerland. And it's important to know that in high school, I had studied French for two years before I left for French speaking Switzerland. Um, and the reason I had done that was because my guidance counselor had said, if you wanna to go to college, you need to study a language. But it was very clear that if you didn't wanna to go to college, you shouldn't study a language because languages were hard. And the only students who would be able to succeed at in language classes would be those who were college bound. So I had this impression in my mind that languages were somehow more difficult than other subjects and they required somehow special talent to be able to succeed. Compare that to the experience that I had in Switzerland. I worked for three months with at, at a residential institution for, for kids with uh, intellectual disabilities and physical disabilities. And at this, at this house, at this um, institution, the kids were learning other languages. First of all, Switzerland is a multilingual country. So some of the kids who were native speakers of French also had some background in German or vice versa. But when they learned that they were gonna have uh, a helper there who knew English natively, they said, oh, great, you can help our kids who wanna learn English. And so I, I find myself in a tutoring role with kids with uh, intellectual disabilities who wanted to learn English. And you know what? That works. It, it, it completely defied what I had thought. And I learned that anyone can learn another language. If you can learn a first language, you can learn a second language. My second anecdote has to do with McKinsey. McKinsey was a student of mine and I think many people have had a McKinsey in their classroom. McKinsey came to me um, having studied French in high school. She was so enthusiastic about French and yet her French was super flawed. She had such trouble with grammar. Oh my gosh, when she spoke, it was like a word salad. And I really had a hard time understanding her, not only because she didn't understand the structure of language, but she really had a hard time with the pronunciation as well. So wouldn't you know it, that same year, her freshman year, she decided to go on a May term travel course with me to Paris. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder how this is gonna work out because some of the assignments when we were in Paris were to talk to people locally. And I thought, if I can't understand her, I wonder how this is gonna work for Parisians to understand her. But you know what? I needn't have worried. She was so charming. She had such great soft skills and she had no fear. And she went around with her very, very flawed French and charmed everyone. And she had no trouble interacting with French people. In fact, they understood her, which I found absolutely amazing. So from McKinsey, I learned that accuracy is overrated. And my third anecdote is from my own background as a basketball player. You can't tell on Zoom, but I'm pretty tall. And when I was in third grade, my parents thought, well, maybe we should sign her up for basketball. So they put me in a Parks and Rec Saturday morning program. And for six weeks, one hour each Saturday, I went to learn to play basketball. The person who was in charge of that program had a very specific idea about how people best learn to play basketball. And the idea was mastery. So we had to learn the basics. For six weeks, all we did was bounce passing for an hour each Saturday, we practiced our bounce passing. And we were not allowed to dribble the ball. We were not allowed to shoot the ball. And for heaven's sakes, we were not allowed to play a game because first we had to master the basics. I bet you can guess what happened after the first six weeks. I quit. I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to play basketball and that didn't seem like playing basketball to me. So from that experience, I learned that curricular design can either repel or attract learners. So those are the kinds of things that began to influence my thinking about curricular design. And I brought them to my colleagues and we all began to rethink our curricular design. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia to talk a little bit more about that. So when we were starting this uh, planning of a change, it was about 2008. Uh, and it took us a full 10 years to get something in place that we really liked. But the, the question that we had then was, what is our goal? 
Should our goal be proficiency as it always had been, or is there a better goal? And if so, is that goal persistence? So I'm gonna lead you through sort of the case study of what happened at Simpson College uh, during that time frame. So um, we started off with the idea. So looking at our practice. So we have a proficiency model. And let's just say that um, our goal was that our students uh, who majored would reach intermediate high. Um, this was what the goal was for German people, but um, in other languages, there were other goals, but this is the German one. So intermediate high was the place that we needed our majors to meet. And because we had this goal and because we needed everybody to meet that goal, we had certain assumptions that um, structured our program. And the first assumption had to do with curricular scope. We looked at our students, we saw who was coming in, we saw the end date of their time at the college, and we thought to ourselves, okay, we have four years. We have four years to get these people to, um, to reach from wherever they are to intermediate high, and then they're done. That is it. Uh, and how are we going to do that? Because as you know, intermediate high is a, is a pretty high standard uh, if students are not going to be studying abroad for a lengthy amount of time. So we've got these four years. We've just got to get it in there, okay? Our curricular vision was, uh, as Sharon was saying, that it was at her high school, um, there are learners who are going to make this, and there are learners who aren't. Um, so uh, we wanted to have the students have near native accuracy by the time they left, uh, and we realized that not everybody in our classes was going to be able to do that. So what we needed to do was, was get everybody on the same page, have the same, uh, everybody at the same level, a homogeneous class and just get them together and then move them forward. And the way we could do that was by prioritizing learners with potential, okay? Our curricular design was also much like uh, Sharon's experience with basketball. Uh, it was compartmentalized uh, in that uh, we had the bifurcation of the program. The early courses were language focused. And once you made it through particular levels of language learning, then you got to do content. Um, we had strict sequencing because if we're gonna get these students um, to the proficiency target that we needed them to get to. Uh, we needed to march them through what we were doing and they had to take one class before they could take the next one, which was followed by the next one and the next one. Um, and what we also realized was, is that um, learners who began our program with no uh, experience in that language uh, we're going to have a really hard time making it through to the end because they were beginning with a deficit, right? Um, students coming in with the background from high school definitely were starting at a higher level. And so it seemed to us that that beginning level was remedial. And it just so happened that that was also the language requirement at Simpson College was that the very beginning level. So um, that was the way then that we were going to teach these skills. And so the curricular driver for this proficiency model was the faculty. We decided uh, what courses were going to be taught, what skills were going to be taught at what level, uh, what kinds of new material we would bring in once they once they reached that vaunted upper level um, and students had to take the classes in the order that they were set up because if we didn't have the sequencing, we would never reach that goal, okay? So we're gonna give you another view of what this curriculum was like. 
So this curriculum was like teaching somebody to succeed walking on a balance beam, right? So you get on on one end and you get off on the other end if you make it to the end um, and it's four inches wide. So you walk one after the other all the way across the beam. And if you've got unathletic people like me in the class, then you're expecting some of those people are gonna fall off because it's just a four inch beam, right? So, um, so again, now, how did this then look uh, with our um, scope? Again, it's limited and defined. It's four inches wide and it goes from one end of the beam to the other, okay? For the vision, talented learners are going to succeed. They can get on at one end, they can get off at the other without uh, falling off. For the design, we'll have careful sequencing uh, and you have to have some background to start. So we're not going to just let anybody get on there because the beam is elevated. It's, you know, we're a litigious society. People fall off of there, then what's going to happen? Um, and uh, we're going to follow strict sequencing. So, okay, you can get up there and then you can walk. But a little bit later, then you can jump. And, you know, if you are among the most talented, then at the end, you can do a backflip on it. But you have to do all those other things first. And there's no messing around on the beat. Okay. Uh, and the idea was, uh, you know, we're coaches here. We got to have some control because we know what these uh, what these students should be doing and the order that they should do it. So this is a schematic of the course structure at Simpson College. I just want to point out that Simpson doesn't actually number any courses at the 400 level. Um, so we have a beginning level, we have an intermediate level, and then we have the advanced level. So all of the electives are also at that time considered 300 level, okay? Um, but that would encompass a normal 300, 400 level at other colleges, just so that, that that's good. So uh, at the beginning level, um, we had pretty robust numbers. You know, we'd have uh, plenty of students who would come in at that beginning level. We had a two semester language requirement. Um, so, we have a little bit of melt from the first semester to the second semester, but that is to be expected, okay? Then we move into 201 and, you know, we lose people there, but that's okay because we don't expect everybody to go on. We want the more talented people to be there. And, you know, as these people drop out, of course, our classes are gonna be homogeneous, right? So it's gonna be easier for us to teach them, easier for the sequencing. So when we get to the 202 level, once again, we have smaller classes, but that's okay. Cause now things are getting kind of hard and not everybody can do that. So then we get to 301 and 302, which at that time were the, um, you know, conversation and composition classes. And it was after that, that you could do the, the so-called content classes. And our numbers would get smaller and smaller, but again, we, we'd expected that until finally we got to those electives and we ended up with very few students. So we started with a lot and we ended up with very few. So um, what this means is that we had created the perfect funnel, right? A lot of students go in and almost nobody comes out and you know, deans and presidents don't like it when you have low numbers in upper level classes. And yet, at least at Simpson, the, the system that we had in place and the way that it worked out, it was a perfect funnel, okay? So that's when we decided we needed to change things. And um, true to form, it was important that we have numbers because that's what's important to our administration. So instead of having a proficiency target, what we needed to do was for students to continue to the next class. So it was a persistence model. 
because students weren't going to able, be able to reach any level of proficiency if they weren't in our classes. If they dropped out, they were never going to reach any higher level of proficiency. So the desire to continue became the thing that we prioritized. Now, because we have a different goal, that means we have different assumptions. So our curricular scope changes. To begin with, we no longer have to think that we have four years and done. Within four years, um, the uh, students must get from wherever they come to a particular level, and then it's out of our hands. We can't do anything else. Well, that's not true. They come to us with more or less experience. We can draw on that. And, you know, when they leave, we all talk about lifelong learning. Well, let's prepare them for that. We're not just uh, at one uh, four year term. So we have a piece of a long continuum. Our curricular vision is that we want curious non-native speakers. We don't need to go for native speaker accuracy. Um, all learners can succeed and we're gonna make it so that they will. Um, it's really not important um, that uh, our classes be homogeneous. In fact, we're gonna have more learners and we're gonna accommodate more learners and that will make them more heterogeneous, okay? But you know, no class was ever homogeneous to begin with. Now we're just embracing uh, homogeneity, uh, heterogeneity. Our curricular design also had to change. And the very first thing that changed was um, we made sure that the beginning level was foundational and transformational for every student who was in it. No matter if that student had experience beforehand or not. Um, and we also made sure that a student could start at the beginning level and graduate with a major, okay? Um, we were also preparing them not to do language skills first and content after, but rather for courses in which language and content were learned in tandem. Um, and so the curricular driver became the students. What is it that will make the students want to continue? And what do we have to do to make sure that all those learners can succeed, okay? So we're gonna give you another visual. So instead of the beam, we are now like a gymnastic floor mat, right? You can't fall off a floor. Well, most people can't fall off a floor mat. I've done it in my life. Um, but even if you do fall, you don't fall far and you can get back on, right? You can go in many different directions. There's not this four inch wide path. Uh, you can go in one direction and come back. You can go sideways and come back. So it's multi-directional. So this is the thing that we were looking at instead. So if we look at the assumptions uh, for a new program, so our scope was wide and long. So we're no longer looking at four years and we're no longer looking at one course followed by another course, followed by another course, followed by another course, okay? Our vision, everyone can succeed. And we decided we would just embrace the fact that every class, no matter what we would try to do, would have multiple skill levels. You cannot have homogeneous classes anyway. So we're gonna embrace that and make sure that everybody can succeed and that everybody can learn from everybody else no matter if they've had previous experience or if they haven't, okay? For design, we want it to be multi-directional. Again, we're not just moving one course after the other in a rigid lockstep. And we didn't want to have sequencing that if a student got out of the sequence, then they could no longer succeed, okay? And so then we had also turned over 
the, um, the control of the program to students. Students have more control. Uh, students have more choices. Students have more input into what is going to be coming along. Uh, and if students have this kind of control, then perhaps that will create in them the desire to continue. So let's look at the uh, schematic of what it became then at Simpson College. So we still did have basically three levels of classes. So there was a beginning, there was an intermediate, and then there was an upper level, okay? Um, in most of the languages at Simpson, the 100 and 102 class were sequential. I could not figure out how to make German non-sequential in 101 and 102. Now, Sharon, Sharon is a curricular genius and Sharon managed to figure out how to get the first two semesters of French be non-sequential, okay? So, um, but it still was important for all of us that once they got to the, to the intermediate level that the students would have a menu of classes to choose from. And at the upper level, there would be another menu and that there would be no order in which these classes had to be taken. So, um, a student could start with the 200A section and then move to 200C, or could start with a B section and move to 200A. Generally speaking, students take two classes at the 200 level, but they can take all three if they want to. Um, so when they move into the 300 level, they're in German, because I was the only professor, there was a four year rotation. So I actually had eight different upper level classes, but I could only teach one a semester. Um, so students uh, would always have something new. But let's just say, uh, you see that the 200, the last 200 level row and the first 300 level row are the same row, right? So let's just say that I had a student who did two classes at 200 then decided to go to the 300 level and do two classes there. And then they wanted to do another class, but I was offering the 200 level class they hadn't seen before, right? And they thought it sounded interesting. No problem, they can go back and do that 200 level class because it's multi-directional. You're not required to keep moving in a strict sequence. Um, so you can pick and choose whatever fulfills uh, what you need to be doing and whatever seems to you to be the most interesting class, that's the one you can do, okay? Um, we still had a problem though, and that problem was, well, even if you have the most dedicated major um, and your classes are the most wonderful classes they could possibly be, at least at Simpson, almost every language major had another major. And not every other major at our college would be accommodating to students who had course conflicts. But if I had a student who was also a biology major and my class met during the same time as their biology lab, very often it was the case that um, in the old system, they would not be able to take a class at all, right? But we didn't want that to happen in this system. We wanted to have a new way for them to be able to at least take something. So we created these courses that are called workshop courses. And workshop courses are half courses. So every course at Simpson is four credits and workshop courses are two credits. So a student who has a conflict can take a two credit course which is not likely to incur an overload fee, right? It's small enough that it won't make them have to pay more money and they can keep their hand in. Workshop courses are generally language focused rather than being um, more content-y based. So for example, I had uh, workshops that were in reading strategies. I had workshops that were in writing strategies. Um, and French had a very successful pronunciation workshop. So they were language-based. 
and they're two credit and they're also mix and match because two two credit classes become one four credit class. So then it fits into the number of credits students need to have. The other thing is, is that each class is repeatable because um, there was a, a lower level in the workshop class and there was a higher level in the workshop class. So any student could take that workshop twice. Uh, and so therefore, they had many more options and we didn't have to have as many workshop classes. Okay, so um, and students could take workshop classes whenever they could fit it in their schedule. So they could take it if they had a course conflict. They could also take it if they had a full time class, but wanted to add that skill that happened to be uh, taught in the workshop that semester. So they could have six credits that semester. Um, so all of these options made it possible for our students to choose more where they wanted to go. I want to point out that this schematic here looks a lot more like a floor mat, doesn't it? And the main thing to note is, is that sure we have drop off when we go from the beginning to the bottom to the higher levels, but it's not as much drop off as it used to be. And so we have not only more students who are able to complete the major, but we have more students who are happy with being in our upper level classes. Okay, so that's what it looked like when we changed the persistence. So for those of you who have actually seen the HOPE presentation, um, this will look familiar to you. Um, we actually, you know, are thinking about persistence and we talked about persistence using this exact slide. And so there are three elements of persistence about which we spoke. They are access, relevance, and community. We just did a quick overview of access. Our goal was to remove all of those barriers, the blocks to getting students to be able to take the class in part. Um, but we're gonna talk about this a little bit about the ability to persist as well. So it's not just the scheduling conflict. We're also then looking at it's not just those talented students, it's everyone that can continue on. And then the next piece of this is really going to be looking at the relevance and community piece, which is that desire to persist. What is it that these students really want in order to continue on? Like, what, what is it? You know, like trying to get into our students' mind, what's gonna keep them? And we thought that these two elements of relevance and community would really be important to them. So, um, as we start thinking about this, you start having conversations about um, the drivers of curriculum, right? We've already said that at once faculty were the drivers and it was persistence now, but it was proficiency. So what is driving your curriculum? Is it that proficiency level? Um, and then who is driving your curriculum? Is it the faculty or is it the students, right? Um, what is the ultimate goal? We really had to start thinking about that. And the moment we started looking at, okay, so if we're moving from just going for a proficiency level um, and, and we're instead moving towards that persistence element, we need to know what the students would like because we want to, we want to figure out. So we went and asked them, this is the, what is your carrot, <laughs> right? What's the carrot that's going to keep you continuing on? What is the thing that is going to help us figure this out? And so um, what's the motivator? So when we're talking about that relevance piece and we're talking about the desire. So the things that they told us were this. First, they told us that they wanted to speak to native speakers, right? It's just like playing basketball. They wanted to actually play the game. They wanted to speak with people, not just talk about speaking with people, right? And so we ensured that we had communication with native speakers of some kind in every single level and every single one of our courses, that that was really important because that's what our students told us very important. Another thing they told us was that they were really looking for better credentials for a job, right? They wanted to make sure that they had those skills. So there were a few things we could do. We could ensure that we were doing projects, we were building more of those soft skills that we know are really important. Um, and that we were focusing some more on some cultural mediation skills, intercultural skills. Um, but that also directly ties to the next thing they told us they wanted. They wanted to learn all about culture, 
right? And so we said, okay, we're going to tie that to mediation between cultures because that actually is a highly employable skill. It's a great credential to have. It's something that will take time to learn. It's something we can help them do. And so we're going to bring these elements together. In addition to this element, we know that community is really important. And we have this place on our campus where they find themselves within our classes and they really bond and they enjoy taking classes within our department, right? So we wanted to make sure that that was a real thing, that they were really a part of it. So building community throughout our course and throughout our entire program was really essential, um, particularly when it comes to that desire to persist. So one of the things, a few things we've tried to do, um, we're making sure we've got those native speaker exchanges, we're making sure that we're bringing in um, guest speakers from around the world. We're bringing the world to them. We're taking them out to study abroad. We're doing projects in our courses. We're sharing them with others. We're not keeping them inside of our classroom. We're actually opening those doors. And what we found um, was that they really depended on each other and got to know each other really well through all of this work. And then it was, what class are you taking next semester? Are we gonna be in the same class? Making sure that some of those things are going on as well. So this is really talking about um, that continued ability and desire to persist. So yeah, as we move on and we start thinking about what does this mean curricularly? How do we build this into a curriculum? We um, opted for using what we would call cultural threads and themes or concepts. And I talked to them about these as ways that we're going to kind of weave all of these ideas of important cultural concepts throughout the curriculum. So again, that beginning level really is foundational. We're doing this, we're introducing them to all of these different elements. It's transformational because it's a new way to learn. It's something that they can actually grab onto and we're gonna introduce that cultural concept there. And then we're gonna weave it into a 200 level or the intermediate course. And there we're gonna start building off of that foundation even more. They have more skills, we can bring in deeper content, we can start working some additional things, but we don't have to make the choice between each one of those. And then when we move to the advanced level, that's when we start getting into greater complexity and depth, but through this same cultural concept that runs throughout the entirety of the program. Now, there are a lot of cultural concepts, um, and there are multiple of them that we actually use within our program. So I'm gonna give you an example of one of these concepts in the Spanish program um, that is part of um, 100 level, like the introductory, the intermediate, and the advanced level, knowing that this is just a piece of it. It's not the entirety of the whole level. Um, what we really talk about is the importance of community and belonging in um, different Spanish speaking cultures. And so for instance, one of the things we would be talking about in a 100 level, the very first semester, we'd be talking about the importance of friendship and the idea of the padrino and expansion of family and your tios and your tias that are not actually blood relationships. How does this actually work? What does that mean? And building on then, okay, so you have this extended family and you have these friends that really are closer than some of your family members. Well, what are some of the traditions that are part of, that they are a part of? How does that actually work together? And then we've got our immediate family and our community there, but what about our responsibility and our extra interactions to that wider community? So at the intermediate level, um, I introduced a course that was all about um, social change, right? What are the social movements and how does that actually work? And what does it mean to be civically engaged and be a member of your community and be a part of it in order to make sure that people are transforming it in healthy ways? Um, I did this specifically in looking at the Ocupación or the Ocupa movement in Spain um, to help students understand what that might look like. And then let's move on to the advanced level. And, you know, we've got this idea of um, elements of our past that we really have to grapple with and that we're still grappling with. And so what are those elements of reconciliation? 
and retelling and rewriting of history, those things that were taboo right now that we're going to bring in and we're going to help heal some of the parts of our community that have been broken in some way, shape or form, or we're going to reclaim different elements and giving it a different voice. So this is one example of a cultural thread. There were multiple throughout these different courses um, and different levels, but this is just an example for you that's related to Spanish. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia to talk about German. Yeah, so this is a, an example from German um, and it's how the thread of the German social market economy runs through the entire curriculum. This is again, just one of the, the cultural threads in the program. The German social market economy, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a market economy that is um, used to uh, reach particular social welfare goals, okay? So it's not a free market economy, it's a, it's a regulated market economy to reach social goals. So uh, we start with this in the very first class, in the very first level, where we talk about the difference between do and z, which is the informal and the formal way to say you, which uh, is really important in the German culture. Um, and we, uh, use this distinction between do and z to try to help define uh, what's my relationship to other people in this society. So it's not just going to be about me. I actually have to care what another person wants to be called, right? Rather than just having the word you being able to be used. So we start to get to this idea of responsibility. In 102, the following class, um, Again, this is a beginning level and we do go shopping. We do uh, the vocabulary and the skills of how you shop in Germany, like you would do in many beginning classes. But we also look at uh, the opening hours in Germany, which are quite restricted for American terms. Um, and we talk about things about those opening hours, such as how ethical is it that um, Lots of people have to work through the night so that I can buy soy sauce at 3 a.m. Or let's think about the ethics of not funding public transportation uh, when we're going to place uh, stores on the outskirts of towns where people who have no cars can't get there. That's not ethical. So we start looking at that instead, uh, the wider repercussions of um, policies. So at the 200 level, we moved into, uh, this is one example, uh, the refugee experience. And again, it's how do you treat other people? Uh, and this is based on the 2015 influx of about a million refugees into Germany. Um, and uh, we look specifically at how Germany uh, sought to and was able to create what it called a culture of welcoming of refugees, rather than the kind of culture that you find in the United States, which is a culture of controlling of refugees. Okay, so we could then do some intercultural comparisons there. And then finally, we have an upper level course where one of the themes is the German basic law, which is the German constitution. Um, and in this class, one of the bases of this class is Article 1 of the German Basic Law, which says all people have dignity. And it is the purpose of the government to protect every person's dignity. So how is your uh, culture based differently when we have to think about the dignity of every other person. And it's no longer about just my dignity, but it's about everybody's dignity. So that's how we, uh, we sort of structured the German courses with this particular thread. So now Sharon's gonna tell you about French. Yeah, so one more example from French. Um, one of the themes that I wove throughout the curriculum was this idea of savoir vivre. It's the you know, the joy of living, um, the good life, and how French people define that. 
So just as an example, in one of the 100 level classes, when we were doing a unit on food, we looked at commercials and we compared commercials for the same types of products from US commercials and, and French commercials. So for example, a commercial for Nutella in the US, a commercial for Nutella in France. And what we could see was that a lot of the cultural values were coming out. So the French commercial is all about tradition and the expertise of the baker who's recommending the Nutella and um, the pride and the quality and so on. And the American commercial is all about how quick and easy it, it is to serve Nutella in the morning in a chaotic household. So we were beginning to get the idea of the importance of quality and tradition and expertise, aesthetic and so on, which are part of Savoir Vivre. In the other 100 level course, we do a unit on school. And within that, we look at the school schedule and pretty soon we see that lunchtime is an hour and a half in a lot of schools in France. Um, that's amazing to students who are used to American schools where you know lunchtime might be 20 minutes if they're lucky. So we talk about why that would be. And it's part of enjoying a meal and French cafeteria meals are still eaten in courses and people take their time and they, and they talk and so on. So that, that idea that, that life is pleasurable and we should take time to enjoy it. At the 200 level, the thread comes up again in a World War II class where we talk about deprivation and we see what happens when the French are occupied by the Nazis and, and not able to enjoy their same savoir vivre and the, the ways that they tried to make do. Um, and so we could see again, the same theme coming out. And one example at the 300 level was in a course looking at film remakes. So we looked at French films and American remakes of those films. And we examined what changed in the American remakes for a different cultural audience. And what we noticed is that things like the beautiful aesthetic or the reference to artwork or something like that might be totally gone in the American version because we're dealing with audiences with um, different goals and different um, cultural values. So once again, you just have another example there of how the same thread can come up at multiple levels. So I'd like to just summarize uh, and then we'll have a chance to discuss. What we did was we went from this curriculum where the courses go in order and they march in a straight line where the 100 level isn't even in the stream yet and where we had to actually give a lot of independent studies because um, of the funnel and the fact that we needed students in our classes, we needed students to continue. So we had to accommodate them when they couldn't stay in the straight line. We went from that to a different model where the 100 level is in the stream, where the stones are wider and you have more options and you can go in different pathways from stone to stone. At this point, all uh, majors included a capstone. We actually divided our capstone in half, um, but we added another course too at the beginning so we offered another 100 level course option. This was for anybody at the college, it was taught in English and it was to help students learn to analyze cultures, to be able to decode cultures. And it was a starting point into our programs as well. So it was required for our majors, um, but also fulfilled general education requirements. So it was attractive to other students and gave us an option to get students involved. Finally, we had to decide that we weren't actually making it all the way across the stream. Maybe we weren't making it across the stream with our other program either, but we weren't admitting that. So we built into our program teaching students to lay the rest of the stones that they wanted to lay because our scope was again longer now beyond our program, beyond the four years. So once again, to summarize, our assumptions had to change. When we changed from a proficiency view to a persistence view, we changed our assumptions about scope, vision, design, and driver. In terms of scope, we went from a limited scope to a lifelong scope. In terms of vision, we went from wanting near native speaker accuracy and being quite selective in order to try to get that to saying that what we really want is just curious non-native speakers so that we could include everyone. In terms of our design, we changed our remedial lower level and our compartmentalized curriculum 
to a foundational lower level that got students started right away on the whole basketball game, the culture and the language together. And we had a tandem progression throughout. And finally, we changed our driver. We were uh, no longer the ones fully in control of the curriculum. We asked our students to help us. We asked them to tell us what they wanted. And then we redesigned around that. So now we're really curious for your thoughts and questions. And we certainly do hope that you'll keep in touch with us. And just a plug to complete the workshop evaluation when all is said and done. That's great. That's so uh, enlightening and inspirational for me. Uh, I've, we, we have tried something similar at the 400 level, but I think you have convinced me that I should try the lower levels. I think this, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, I think we have uh, about half an hour. I think we're gonna have a discussion, I'm sure. This is so timely because I think many of us are experiencing this lower enrollment. I think it's also time to think creatively about curriculum design and in response to the needs. Uh, I will start with two questions. Um, number one is uh, at the lower level, if you adopt this rotational theme-based approach, uh, you are going to have uh, students of various proficiency levels and that may be a challenge. I don't know how you deal with that. My second question is about the identifying the themes. Uh, I found those themes very, very attractive. If I put myself in the, in the chair of the student, uh, I'm wondering how you identify those. I see in the three languages, you have slightly different uh, thematic units. Is that based on the survey of student, the learner needs analysis, or is that based on the collective wisdom of faculty, uh, based on their experience of many, many years of teaching? Because we, we did have something similar when I was in a group of 50 people to design the thematic units for AP World languages. What we did was to gather 50 people uh, from world languages from both college level and pre college level. We get together, we think about uh, what are the important uh, things students should know and be able to do in the 21st century. So we, we we use reference like uh, the, the, the common standards and then the 21st schools and then things from Apple. And then these 50 people, uh, if you add them, the teaching experience together, I'm sure there's like hundreds of years of experience. I think when I think about validation, <laughs> what we call the expert validation, we have, that, we have not that much survey of students' needs. Uh, so, so those are my questions, identification of the themes and then the challenge of various proficiency levels at lower level. Uh, so I'm sure all of us enjoyed the talk and I'm probably ready to share your own experiences. And so let's use the, the, the last half an hour uh, for that. I can certainly take on the question about um, a variety of proficiency levels and maybe somebody else wants to take on the question about choosing themes. So in terms of the proficiency levels, one of the things that we didn't include in this talk but is included in the recorded talk from Hope College is that we decided to let students choose their placement on their own. And we gave them all the tools